What if we told you that the first automobile company to pioneer breakthroughs like seatbelts and safety glass wasn't Ford, Toyota, or Mercedes, but a company you've probably never heard of? The year is 1946, and America has emerged from World War II optimistic about a peaceful future. And while Japan and Europe are largely decimated, increased factory output from the war effort poised America to become a global manufacturing powerhouse for years to come. Yet many factories sit empty, yearning to be fired up, and returning soldiers ready to get back to work. And since none of the big three automakers have released a new model car since 1941, there was a strong desire from the motoring public for something fresh. This created a perfect storm for the car of the future. Enter Preston Tucker, a talented car salesman turned inventor and pioneer. His automobile vision promised and delivered several groundbreaking advances in automotive technology and safety that later became standard. The story of Tucker and his automobile company is full of innovation and intrigue. But in the end, only 51 Tucker cars were made, and the company shuttered its doors not long after it opened them. To understand this David and Goliath story, we will examine the rise and fall of Tucker and how a conspiracy perpetrated by corporations, politicians, and even government officials crushed the Tucker Corporation, the man himself, and ultimately his revolutionary car, 47 of which survive today. Preston Tucker was born in 1903 on a farm in Michigan, growing up on the outskirts of Detroit and learning to drive at the age of 11. He married his wife Vera in 1923 and then bounced around as a salesman for numerous car companies such as Studebaker, Chrysler, and Dodge. He would also work odd jobs for Cadillac and Ford and then build and modify race cars at the Indianapolis 500. Tucker went from fascination with automobiles to obsession with them. In 1937, he would move his family to a large property in Ypsilanti, Michigan, with a barn that would later become the home of the Ypsilanti Machine and Tool Company. Tucker dreamed in the currency of cars, but with World War II looming on the horizon, he decided to try his luck developing something for the war effort. First with the Tucker Tiger, a quirky armored combat car that could do more than 100 miles per hour, but never saw production or adoption. And even though the American military found the Tiger to be too fast, they did like the Tucker turret. And although Preston dabbled one last time with military aircrafts, he quickly returned to his true calling, cars. In 1944, Preston Tucker started working on plans for his new automobile and went through multiple designers finally landing on the now iconic design of his Tucker Torpedo as it was then called. Tucker cared deeply for design language and wanted his car to strike a balance of beauty, emotion, and aerodynamics. But the car of tomorrow would also need new innovations in both convenience and safety. In 1946, Tucker published drawings of his concept car dubbed the Tucker Torpedo in Science Illustrated. You could almost hear the motoring world ooing and aahing at what could only be described as va va voom. The public shared his obsession and responded with a hearty, yes please. In late 1946, Tucker landed on a final design with a slew of safety features, a modified helicopter engine, and the iconic third headlight dubbed the Cyclops Eye. But in order to raise funds to secure a factory and begin producing cars, Tucker had to sell dealership rights and floated a $20 million stock issue known today as an IPO. In 1947, Tucker was able to raise the $15 million to secure the largest factory building in the world, the 475-acre Dodge Chicago Aircraft Engine Plant. So with manufacturing facility in hand and $17 million in the bank, the Tucker Corporation was officially up and running. Now all that was left was to start building and delivering cars, right? Not so fast. Tucker was sure to face the usual problems of any new business, but there was no way he could foresee the plots and schemes his enemies had in store for him. It would be an understatement to say that Tucker had some bad luck. And while Lady Luck definitely played her part, there were other forces at play. Tucker himself and the SEC. First he had himself. Tucker wanted things like disc brakes, fuel injection, direct drive torque converters, and a completely new engine design. And while he may have been right in viewing the absence of these as complacency from the big car companies, Tucker was overly ambitious in trying to fit so many innovative features into a version one vehicle. And not being an engineer, perhaps he didn't understand how valuable incremental development is and how much time and resources it can actually take to perfect groundbreaking features. 
The Tucker prototype was shown at the Chicago factory to an excited crowd of over 3,000 people, but perhaps it was a hasty decision as several problems threatened to torpedo the launch, including broken suspension arms, a very loud engine, and a radiator that boiled over. Subsequently, top newspaper columnist Drew Pearson reported publicly that the car was a fraud, partly because it could not go in reverse, even though this was only an issue with the prototype. But the car's reputation was damaged, and the further onslaught of negative media to follow only made the situation worse. It was even called the Tin Goose, an insult referring to the Howard Hughes-built Spruce Goose, which infamously only flew once. But Tucker could have fixed and likely recovered if these were his only problems. But there were more serious hurdles in the offing. Before we move to the SEC, let's talk about the elephant in the room, the big three automakers. It's no surprise that Ford, GM, and Chrysler would not be thrilled about a competitor like Tucker but the extent they would go to in order to stifle him is certainly up for debate. The Francis Ford Coppola movie, Tucker, The Man and His Dream, would have us believe that Tucker was a pure visionary, crushed by the big three and the political interests they controlled. Some research papers written on the subject suggest quite the opposite, that Tucker was a poor businessman, even a charlatan, and needed no help in destroying his own company. Regardless of which camp you fall in, the alleged tactics by the big three are interesting. One was to pressure their own supply suppliers into not selling parts to Tucker, and another was to use their ability to re-elect political officials as a lever for stomping on the competition. For instance, Tucker put in bids on two different steel mills which he needed badly to build cars. But these were rejected by the War Assets Administration, which was headed up by none other than U.S. Senator Homer Ferguson of Michigan. And Michigan, being home to Detroit and Motor City, didn't take kindly to this new upstart from Chicago. As the story goes, Ferguson needed auto industry backing in order to win re-election, and there have been no shortage of opinions and conspiracy theories ever since. The Securities and Exchange Commission was on Tucker's case from day one. The SEC had been burned by Kaiser Fraser, a small automaker that had been given $200 million in grants toward development of a new car and ultimately frittered the money away. Even though Tucker took no money from the federal government, they were determined to place him under the most powerful investigative microscope. In order to raise enough investment money and prior to his IPO, Tucker began selling dealerships and franchises, reasoning that the SEC did not have any say in the matter. The SEC disagreed and required Tucker to amend all dealer contracts to state there was a risk of bankruptcy, which resulted in lackluster initial funding. One of Tucker's most forward-thinking ideas was also sadly the linchpin of the SEC investigation, selling accessories for the Tucker car before the car had even been produced. It was brilliant. You could buy a Tucker radio and not only have a priority spot on the waiting list, for one of the first cars, but you could install the radio yourself. But in 1948, an SEC investigation determined that pre-selling accessories was not only illegal, but also fraudulent. The SEC ordered production of cars stopped and the factory shut down for its ongoing investigation. Tucker fired back by publishing an open letter to the automobile industry, a full-page newspaper ad where he intimated that he was being held down by political and SEC conspiracies it did not work. In 1949, Tucker and six other Tucker executives were indicted on violations of SEC regulations and conspiracy to defraud. In 1950, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty on all counts for all the accused. While an undeniable personal victory for Preston Tucker and the other executives, the Tucker Corporation was now in massive debt and the negative press going for three years strong made any recovery next to impossible. The Tucker Corporation had been dealt its final death blow and the car of the future relegated to the fond memories of the past. By this point, you might be thinking the cards are stacked against the little guys and the system is rigged or at least unfair. But before you lose all hope, things have changed since Tucker's time and if you are crazy enough to have a dream, there's probably never been a better time to be alive with a dream. People quickly realize that those with the money and those with the ideas aren't necessarily one and the same. And though venture capital isn't a new idea, it's become increasingly lucrative, exciting, and widely available in recent times. Even if you have a half-baked idea, the right kind of spin can garner a large investment. We see failed startups all the time, but it's a gamble VC groups are willing to take. 
And if you are an early visionary like Elon Musk, Dean Kamen, Steve Jobs, or Richard Branson, you are likely to have VCs competing with large sums of money for a piece of the action, a luxury that Preston Tucker did not have. Although conspiracies can still be perpetrated against the upstarts of this world, it is much harder to hide from the public. The world of today is orders of magnitude more connected than in the 1940s, and world-changing ideas like global renewable energy expansion as envisioned by Tesla's Elon Musk have a much better chance to make the world a better place. Although the Tucker automobile will live on in museums and as collectibles for the rich, the lesson of Preston Tucker's vision will outlive the physical manifestations seen in his 47 surviving steel marvels. That lesson is both fascinating and sobering, even today.